Night has fallen, and the moon is a glowing golden orb in the black sky. See how it shines on the dark back roads of America, and on one road in particular. Come with us, and we'll take a walk down the moonlit road, for the night is waiting, and the moon is full. The Moonlit Road presents Episode Four: Skull Lake, written by Craig Dominey and told by David Hurt. Back where I grew up in Central Alabama, there's an old rock quarry deep in the piney woods, abandoned a long time ago by a mining company. Now ask a local, and they'll direct you to an overgrown dirt road just off the highway, past the old Reese service station. Follow that road to the end. And you'll wind up at the edge of a deep, jagged crater. Now, at the bottom of that crater is one of the best swimming holes you're ever likely to see. Clean, deep blue water, just waiting to cool you off on a hot summer day. But don't be fooled. None of the locals would dare swim in it these days, especially at night when there's a full moon out. Everyone says the lake is cursed, even haunted. And the truth is. I'm partly to blame for it. Back when I was a boy, we all got word one day that the county's largest employer, the Reynolds Mineral Company, had gone bankrupt and was moving out. Now this was bad news for our parents who'd worked the mines for years and were already struggling to get by. But for us boys, halfway through our high school years, it was the best news ever. You see, in those days we didn't have video games, the internet, or shopping malls to keep us amused. When you grew up deep in the country, you had to make your own fun. So, with that blazing Alabama sun beating down on us every summer, our quest became to find the next great swimming hole. We knew the Reynolds Mineral Company used a huge lake in their quarry for mining operations. So, as soon as the last Reynolds truck rolled away from the site on closing day, we quickly made our plans. We decided to cut the last day of school and head out to the swimming hole. Although the quarry was several miles deep in the woods, we didn't want the sheriff coming out to the site, which he might have done if we had waited to the weekend. Eight of us went out the lake that day. Marty, Jeff, and I were best friends and the oldest of the bunch. The rest were a bunch of younger boys we barely knew and didn't want tagging along, but they threatened to snitch on us if we didn't. Marty snuck a couple of cases of beer away from his daddy while Jeff took his brother's truck. As soon as we were out of our parents' eyesight, we ditched our school books and took off us older boys in the cab and them five kids in the back. As we drove toward the old mining company turnoff, that we passed back and forth a couple of times, trying not to draw attention from passing cars. But when the coast was clear, Jeff gunned his truck down that long wooded road. <laughs> He laughed and hollered as that truck bounced wildly on the rough road, tossing those brat kids around in the back like a bunch of rag dolls. <laughs> After a mile or so, the road leveled out, and I gazed at the endless rows of pine trees zipping past us. I remember the woods seemed to close in on us the deeper we went, enveloping us in a in a thick blanket of pine branches. Even with all the laughter and the roar of the truck, I remember how still those woods were. Not a single plane could be heard overhead. Not a bird chirping, nor a fly buzzing. No natural sounds at all. Just rows and rows of trees stretching endlessly into the dark forest beyond. I wondered who or what must live back there in the darkness. Hey, wake up, spaceman! Yelled Marty, cramming a bear into my hand. I smiled and took a big swig. My anticipation building once again. The road suddenly ended in a locked gate with an ominous "no trespassing" sign. But the simple padlock was no match for Jeff. He had learned a thing or two about picking locks from his older brother, who was constantly in and out of jail for petty burglaries of some sort. So Jeff whipped out one of his mama's hairpins and, in no time at all, picked that lock and tossed it in the woods. Jeff rammed that truck through that gate and roared down the back road, howling with laughter. <laughs> We then zipped by an old rusted sign that read "Reynolds Mineral." About time, I thought. It seemed like those woods would never end. Damn it! Screamed Jeff. Slamming on his brakes, bear splashed all over me. What's wrong with you? I yelled at him. 
we all looked out the window. Just mere feet from the truck. The earth opened up without warning into a massive crater yawning up at the open blue sky with a mouthful of jagged, rocky teeth. At the bottom was the deep, cool lake we'd heard about. Its glassy surface undisturbed, not a ripple on it as if it was waiting all this time just for us. Faster than you can say abandoned ship, we jumped out of that truck, scurried to the bottom of the crater, stripped down to our skivvies, and dove into the water. <laughs> we laughed and yelled and splashed around, our voices bouncing off the rock walls all around us. We knew there wasn't a soul around who could hear us. As the blazing sun paced overhead, the beers we'd been drinking all day got to our heads. We wobbled around the lake's edge on jello legs, barely staying upright on the slick rocks. I can't say I remember much about that afternoon, so it goes without saying I didn't notice when one of the younger boys, named Logan, suddenly wandered off. Hey! Hey! Help! Help! I, I need help! screamed one of the younger boys. I looked over at him, jumping frantically up and down on a pile of rocks near the shoals. This must be a trap, I thought. Soon as I come over there, he and his brat friends are going to push me in the water. Then I saw the fear in his eyes, and I knew this was no joke. Get over here quick! Logan's hurt! We, we rushed over to the rocks and peered down at the shoals. There, crumpled on the rocks, lay little Logan, unconscious and pale as a sheet, and blood streaming from his forehead. He had never touched the water, slipping on his way down. None of us knew a thing about CPR or any other kind of medical training. All Jeff could think to do was pick up little Logan, shake him, and scream over and over again, Wake up! Wake up! But little Logan didn't wake up, and we didn't feel him breathing. None of us really knew what to do. So Jeff laid him back on the ground, and we all stood there, staring in silent disbelief at Logan's lifeless body. Then, panic started to creep in. Now, there's a world difference between fear and panic. Fear, you can sometimes think your way out of logically, but panic, now that's a different story. And if you're a panicked, drunk, and naive teenage boy, you got a real good chance right then and there of making some stupid life decisions. We're going to get in a lot of trouble, Jeff finally muttered after what seemed like hours. We go for help. They're going to know we've been trespassing. And we've been drinking, too. They're going to think we helped kill this kid, giving him a beer and all. So what do we do, I heard myself ask. Jeff didn't hesitate. We're going to have to hide his body. For all we know, he, he ran away from home, and we haven't seen him since. That's what we'll say if anyone asks. Some of the younger kids began to sniffle and cry. Jeff looked in their eyes and knew they might not go along with his plan. He glared at them and said, You kids say anything about it, and I'll tell your parents or the sheriff or whoever that you pushed him off them rocks, and you'll be in jail for the rest of your lives, or maybe even the army. It'll be my word against yours. You understand? One by one, the young boys nodded their heads. We're going to have to make a pact, Jeff said to all of us. We do this, nobody can ever say anything about it for the rest of our lives. We never signed a binding contract that day, but our scared glances at one another were agreement enough. So Jeff fetched a long chain from the truck and wrapped it around little Logan's body. We carried him into the water and dove in as deep as we could go, dragging him with us. We found a large rock underwater, and we tied him tightly to it. I remember little Logan's eyes stayed shut as we buried him in his watery tomb. No expression on his face whatsoever. Maybe he was at peace, I thought to myself. Maybe he could care less what we were doing to him. We emerged from the water, gasping for breath, and marched quickly back to the truck, grabbing little Logan's clothes along with our own. Then we made that long, silent journey back home, leaving the swimming hole of death far behind. As the next few days passed, I can't say I was racked with guilt over what had happened to Logan. 
Maybe it was the beer or just plain denial. But it was as if the whole thing was just one bad dream. And even if it wasn't, the kid did it to himself, I reckoned. Soon afterwards, we got a huge summer rainstorm. One of those storms the South is famous for, when days of humid, unbearable heat are blasted away by a real frog strangler of a storm. I knew that storm was filling up the swimming hole and washing away every trace of us. Our footprints, tire tracks, whatever else we carelessly left behind. I'll be damned, I thought. We're actually going to get away with this. Then one day my daddy walked into my room with a dead serious look on his face. He asked if I knew Logan. Now, I didn't lie. I told him he went to my school, but he was younger than me, so I didn't give him the time of day. Then Daddy told me the police had been out to the old Reynolds quarry. How they ended up out there, I never found out. But they had found little Logan's body. I I played it cool, asking Daddy how this Logan kid had died. He drowned, Daddy answered. Somebody chained his body underwater. I could only stare back at my Daddy in silent disbelief. He gave me a tight hug, thinking I was in shock, and I was, but not for the reasons he thought. Because it was then that I knew the awful truth. Logan was alive when he fell on the shoals, and we had drowned him. We were all officially murderers. From that day forward, none of us who went out to the swimming hole that day spoke to one another. We always thought the police would ask questions, but they never did. The discovery of Logan's body had made our silent pact even stronger. Well, our classmates treated us the same as always, no suspicion in their eyes. After graduation a couple of years later, I moved away to Memphis, Tennessee, and I landed a job at a local manufacturing plant. I married and had two kids of my own. As far as I was concerned, them bad memories were buried with my old life back in Podunk, Alabama. That is, until I would fall asleep at night. Then I would find myself standing on that familiar dirt road deep in the piney woods, the trees silent, all life sucked out of the air. Not a bird, not an airplane, not a fly. Just silence. And those dark woods would beckon me forward, though I knew exactly what was waiting for me at the end. I would reach the swimming hole, wade slowly into the water, and then dive into the murky depths. And there at the bottom, little Logan waited for me, still chained to that rock, still a young boy. But this time, his eyes were open. Staring coldly into mine. His mouth didn't move, but I could hear a voice coming from him, and it was always that same sinister whisper. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. One morning, my wife woke me from this daily nightmare to tell me I had a phone call. Even after having the same dream for so long, I would still wake up a frightened man, my eyes bloodshot, skin clammy, bed sheets soaked with sweat. So it's with shaking hands I took the receiver. And I was shocked at the voice I heard at the other end. It was Jeff calling me for the first time in 15 years, but he wasn't calling to talk about the good old days. He quickly asked me if I had been in touch with any of the boys from that night. Strange things are going on, he said. It turns out the other boys who were with us that night had gone missing. Everyone had moved to different towns, but the story, well, it was the same. They each woke up one morning, went to work or some other place, and never came back. Police were called, missing persons cases were filed, but no one ever returned. It was as if they had just been snatched off the face of the earth. But Jeff wasn't buying it. He told me about the dreams he was having, of young Logan staring at him with impassive eyes in his watery grave, 
whisper in that same mantra. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. I didn't have the heart to tell Jeff I was having the same dream. I managed some weak words of encouragement, but panic was beginning to creep in. That was the last time I would ever speak to Jeff. Several days later, he left his Birmingham home to grab a beer with friends and disappeared. His car was never found, nor was his body. Like the others, he simply vanished. I knew then I was the last one on the list, and little Logan was coming for me. There was only one place where I knew I'd be safe, so one morning... I hugged my wife and kids and told them I was going to visit my parents back in Alabama. But I had no intention of going home. I went straight to the county police station and confessed everything. But all these years later, as I write you this story from behind bars, deep within the bowels of a high-security prison, I still don't feel safe. Little Logan still visits me in my dreams and I listened for his tiny wet footsteps to come walking down the hall one night to drag me deep into those dark woods back to the dark waters of the Reynolds Mineral Quarry to face a judgment that no earthly law can provide. <sighs> oh, and what about that old swimming hole? Well, after news got out about Logan's death, the county built tough new security fences around the crater to discourage any future would-be swimmers. But they could have saved their tax dollars, for the locals were too scared to venture out there. But every once in a while you'll hear about a ghost hunter or a thrill seeker or some other crazy person who makes the long journey to see where our crime took place. And they come back describing an odd and terrifying sight. When the moon is full, they swear they see a reflection in that still black water below in the shape of a skull near the spot where little Logan died. That's why that notorious swimming hole now carries the name Skull Lake. That concludes this tale from the Moonlit Road. Be sure to visit our website at themoonlitroad.com to find out more about our stories and let us know how we're doing. The Moonlit Road is produced and directed by Craig Dominey, Recorded and soundscaped by Henry Howard in beautiful Stone Mountain, Georgia. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>